Part 1 August 25, 1991 Dear friend, I am writing to you because she said you listen and understand and didn't try to sleep with that person at that party even though you could have. Please don't try to figure out who she is because then you might figure out who I am and I really don't want you to do that. I will call people by different names or generic names because I don't want you to find me. I didn't enclose a return address for the same reason. I mean nothing bad by this, honest. I just need to know that someone out there listens and understands and doesn't try to sleep with people even if they could have. I need to know that these people exist. I think you of all people would understand that because I think you of all people are alive and appreciate what that means. At least I hope you do because other people look to you for strength and friendship and it's that simple. At least that's what I've heard. So this is my life. And I want you to know that I am both happy and sad and I'm still trying to figure out how that could be. I try to think of my family as a reason for me being this way, especially after my friend Michael stopped going to school one day last spring and we heard Mr. Vaughn's voice on the loudspeaker. Boys and girls, I regret to inform you that one of our students has passed on. We will hold a memorial service for Michael Dobson during assembly this Friday. I don't know how news travels around school and why it is very often right. Maybe it was in the lunchroom. It's hard to remember. But Dave with the awkward glasses told us that Michael killed himself. His mom played bridge with one of Michael's neighbors and they heard the gunshot. I don't really remember much of what happened after that, except my older brother came to Mr. Vaughn's office in my middle school and told me to stop crying. Then, he put his arm on my shoulder and told me to get it out of my system before Dad came home. We then went to eat french fries at McDonald's, and he taught me how to play pinball. He even made a joke that because of me, he got to skip an afternoon of school and asked me if I wanted to help him work on his Camaro. I guess I was pretty messy because he never let me work on his Camaro before. At the guidance counselor sessions, they asked the few of us who actually liked Michael to say a few words. I think they were afraid that some of us would try to kill ourselves or something because they looked very tense and one of them kept touching his beard. Bridget, who was crazy, said that sometimes she thought about suicide when commercials come on during TV. She was sincere, and this puzzled the guidance counselors. Carl, who was nice to everyone, said that he felt very sad, but could never kill himself because it is a sin. This one guidance counselor went through the whole group and finally came to me. What do you think, Charlie? What was so strange about this was the fact that I had never met this man because he was a specialist, and he knew my name even though I wasn't wearing a name tag like they do in open house. Well, I think that Michael was a nice guy, and I don't understand why he did it. As much as I feel sad, I think that not knowing is what really bothers me. I just reread that, and it doesn't sound like how I talk. Especially in that office, because I was crying still. I never did stop crying. The counselor said that he suspected that Michael had problems at home, and didn't feel like he had anyone to talk to. That's maybe why he felt all alone and killed himself. Then, I started screaming at the guidance counselor that Michael could have talked to me, and I started crying even harder. He tried to calm me down by saying that he meant an adult, like a teacher or a guidance counselor. But it didn't work, and eventually my brother came by the middle school in his Camaro to pick me up. For the rest of the school year, the teachers treated me differently and gave me better grades, even though I didn't get any smarter. To tell you the truth, I think I made them all nervous. Michael's funeral was strange because his father didn't cry. And three months later, he left Michael's mom. At least according to Dave at lunchtime. I think about it sometimes. I wonder what went on in Michael's house around dinner and TV shows. Michael never left a note, or at least his parents didn't let anyone see it. Maybe it was problems at home. I wish I knew. It might make me miss him more clearly. It might have made sad sense. One thing I do know is 
that it makes me wonder if I have problems at home. But it seems to me that a lot of other people have it a lot worse. Like when my sister's first boyfriend started going around with another girl, and my sister cried for the whole weekend. My dad said, There are other people who have it a lot worse. And my mom was quiet. And that was that. A month later, my sister met another boy and started playing happy records again. And my dad kept working, and my mom kept sweeping, and my brother kept fixing his Camaro. That is, until he left for college at the beginning of the summer. He's playing football for Penn State, but he needed the summer to get his grades right to play football. I don't think that there is a favorite kid in our family. There are three of us, and I am the youngest. My brother is the oldest. He is a very good football player, and he likes his car. My sister is very pretty, and mean to boys, and she is in the middle. I get straight A's now, like my sister, and that is why they leave me alone. My mom cries a lot during TV programs. My dad works a lot and is an honest man. My Aunt Helen used to say that my dad was going to be too proud to have a midlife crisis. It took me until around now to understand what she meant by that, because he just turned 40 and nothing has changed. My Aunt Helen was my favorite person in the whole world. She was my mom's sister. She got straight A's when she was a teenager, and she used to give me books to read. My father said that the books were a little too old for me, but I liked them, so he just shrugged and let me read. My Aunt Helen lived with the family for the last few years of her life because something very bad happened to her. Nobody would tell me what happened to her then, even though I always wanted to know. When I was around seven, I stopped asking about it because I kept asking like kids always do, and my Aunt Helen started crying very hard. That's when my dad slapped me, saying, you're hurting your Aunt Helen's feelings. I didn't want to do that, so I stopped. Aunt Helen told my father not to hit me in front of her ever again, and my father said this was his house and he would do what he wanted, and my mom was quiet and so were my brother and sister. I don't remember much more than that because I started crying really hard, and after a while my dad had my mom take me to my room. It wasn't until much later that my mom had a few glasses of white wine and told me what happened to her sister. Some people really do have it a lot worse than I do. They really do. I should probably go to sleep now. It's very late. I don't know why I wrote a lot of this down for you to read. The reason I wrote this letter is because I start high school tomorrow, and I am really afraid of going. Love always, Charlie. September 7th, 1991 Dear friend, I do not like high school. The cafeteria is called the Nutrition Center, which is strange. There is this one girl in my advanced English class named Susan. In middle school, Susan was very fun to be around. She liked movies, and her brother Frank made her tapes of this great music that she shared with us. But over the summer, she had her braces taken off, and she got a little taller and prettier and grew breasts. Now she acts a lot dumber in the hallways, especially when boys are around. And I think it's sad because Susan doesn't look as happy. To tell you the truth, she doesn't like to admit she's in the advanced English class, and she doesn't like to say hi to me in the hall anymore. When Susan was at the guidance counselor meeting about Michael, she said that Michael once told her that she was the prettiest girl in the whole world, braces and all. Then he asked her to go with him, which was a big deal at any school. They call it going out in high school. And they kissed and talked about movies, and she missed him terribly because he was her best friend. It's funny, too, because boys and girls normally weren't best friends around my school. But Michael and Susan were. Kind of like my Aunt Helen and me. Oh, I'm sorry. My Aunt Helen and I. That's one thing I learned this week. That and more consistent punctuation. I keep quiet most of the time, and only one kid named Sean really seemed to notice me. He waited for me after gym class and said really immature things like how he was going to give me a swirly, which is where someone sticks your head in the toilet and flushes to make your hair swirl around. He seemed pretty unhappy as well, and I told him so. Then he got mad and started hitting me, and I just did the things my brother taught me to do. My brother is a very good fighter. Go for the knees, throat, and eyes. And I did. And I really hurt Sean. And then I started crying. 
and my sister had to leave her senior honors class and drive me home. I got called to Mr. Small's office, but I didn't get suspended or anything because a kid told Mr. Small the truth about the fight. Sean started it. It was self-defense. And it was. I just don't understand why Sean wanted to hurt me. I didn't do anything to him. I am very small. That's true. But I guess Sean didn't know I could fight. The truth is, I could have hurt him a lot worse. And maybe I should have. I thought I might have to if he came after the kid who told Mr. Small the truth, but Sean never did go after him. So everything was forgotten. Some kids look at me strange in the hallways because I don't decorate my locker, and I'm the one who beat up Sean and couldn't stop crying after he did it. I guess I'm pretty emotional. It has been very lonely because my sister is busy being the oldest one in her family. My brother is busy being a football player at Penn State. After the training camp, his coach said that he was second string and that when he starts learning the system, he will be first string. My dad really hopes he will make it to the pros and play for the Steelers. My mom is just glad he gets to go to college for free because my sister doesn't play football and there wouldn't be enough money to send both of them. That's why she wants me to keep working hard so I'll get an academic scholarship. So that's what I'm doing until I meet a friend here. I was hoping that the kid who told the truth could become a friend of mine, but I think he was just being a good guy by telling. Love always, Charlie. September 11th, 1991 Dear friend, I don't have a lot of time because my advanced English teacher assigned us a book to read, and I like to read books twice. Incidentally, the book is To Kill a Mockingbird. If you haven't read it, I think you should because it is very interesting. The teacher has assigned us a few chapters at a time, but I do not like to read books like that. I am halfway through the first time. Anyway, the reason I am writing to you is because I saw my brother on television. I normally don't like sports too much, but this was a special occasion. My mother started crying, and my father put his arm around her shoulder, and my sister smiled, which is funny because my brother and sister always fight when he's around. But my older brother was on television, and so far, it has been the highlight of my two weeks in high school. I miss him terribly, which is strange because we never really talked much when he was here. We still don't talk, to be honest. I would tell you his position, but like I said, I would like to be anonymous to you. I hope you understand. Love always, Charlie. September 16th, 1991 Dear friend, I have finished To Kill a Mockingbird. It is now my favorite book of all time, but then again, I always think that until I read another book. My advanced English teacher asked me to call him Bill when we are not in class, and he gave me another book to read. He says that I have a great skill at reading and understanding language, and he wanted me to write an essay about To Kill a Mockingbird. I mentioned this to my mom, and she asked why Bill didn't recommend that I just take a sophomore or junior English class. And I told her that Bill said that these were basically the same classes with more complicated books, and that it wouldn't help me. My mom said that she wasn't sure and would talk to him during an open house. Then, she asked me to help her by washing the dishes, which I did. Honestly, I don't like doing dishes. I like eating with my fingers and off napkins, but my sister says that doing so is bad for the environment. She is a part of the Earth Day Club here in high school, and that is where she meets the boys. They're all very nice to her, and I don't really understand why, except maybe the fact that she is pretty. She really is mean to these boys. One boy has it particularly hard. I won't tell you his name, but I will tell you all about him. He has very nice brown hair, and he wears it long with a ponytail. I think he will regret this when he looks back on his life. He is always making mixtapes for my sister with very specific themes. One was called Autumn Leaves. He included many songs by the Smiths. He even hand-colored the cover. After the movie he rented was over and he left, my sister gave me the tape. Do you want this, Charlie? I took the tape, but I felt weird about it because he had made it for her. But I listened to it and loved it very much. There is one song called Asleep that I would like you to listen to. I told my sister about it, and a week later she thanked me because when this boy asked her about the tape, 
She said exactly what I said about the song Asleep, and this boy was very moved by how much it meant to her. I hope this means I will be good at dating when the time comes. I should stick to the subject, though. That is what my teacher Bill tells me to do, because I write kind of the way I talk. I think that is why he wants me to write that essay about To Kill a Mockingbird. This boy who likes my sister is always respectful to my parents. My mom likes him very much because of this. My dad thinks he's soft. I think that's why my sister does what she does to him. This one night, she was saying very mean things about how he didn't stand up to the class bully when he was 15 or something like that. To tell you the truth, I was just watching the movie he had rented, so I wasn't paying very close attention to their fight. They fight all the time. So I figured that the movie was at least something different, which it wasn't because it was a sequel. Anyway... After she leaned into him for about four movie scenes, which I guess is about ten minutes or so, he started crying. Crying very hard. Then I turned around and my sister pointed at me. You see? Even Charlie stood up to his bully. You see? And this guy got really red-faced. And he looked at me. Then he looked at her. And he wound up and hit her hard across the face. I mean hard. I just froze because I couldn't believe he did it. It was not like him at all to hit anybody. He was the boy that made mixtapes with themes and hand-colored covers until he hit my sister and stopped crying. The weird part is that my sister didn't do anything. She just looked at him very quietly. It was so weird. My sister goes crazy if you eat the wrong kind of tuna, and here was this guy hitting her, and she didn't say anything. She just got soft and nice. And she asked me to leave, which I did. After the boy had left, she said that they were going out, and not to tell Mom or Dad what happened. I guess he stood up to his bully. And I guess that makes sense. That weekend, my sister spent a lot of time with this boy and they laughed a lot more than they usually did. On Friday night, I was reading my new book, but my brain got tired, so I decided to watch some television instead. And I opened the door to the basement, and my sister and this boy were naked. He was on top of her, and her legs were draped over either side of the couch. And she screamed at me in a whisper, Get out! You pervert! So I left. The next day, we all watched my brother play football and my sister invited this boy over. I am not sure when he left the previous night. They held hands and acted like everything was happy. And this boy said something about how the football team hasn't been the same since my brother graduated, and my dad thanked him. And when the boy left, my dad said that this boy was becoming a fine young man who could carry himself. And my mom was quiet. And my sister looked at me to make sure I wouldn't say anything, and that was that. Yes. He is. That's all my sister could say. And I could see this boy at home doing his homework and thinking about my sister naked. And I could see them holding hands at football games that they do not watch. And I could see this boy throwing up in the bushes at a party house. And I could see my sister putting up with it. And I felt very bad for both of them. Love always, Charlie. September 18th, 1991 Dear friend, I never told you that I am in shop class, did I? Well, I am in shop class, and it is my favorite class next to Bill's advanced English class. I wrote the essay for To Kill a Mockingbird last night, and I handed it in to Bill this morning. We are supposed to talk about it tomorrow during lunch period. The point, though, is that there is a guy in shop class named Nothing. I'm not kidding. His name is Nothing. And he is hilarious. Nothing got his name when kids used to tease him in middle school. I think he's a senior now. The kids started calling him Patty when his real name was Patrick. And nothing told these kids. Listen, you either call me Patrick or you call me nothing. So the kids started calling him nothing. And the name just stuck. He was a new kid in the school district at the time because his dad married a new woman in this area. I think I will stop putting quotation marks around nothing's name because it is annoying and disrupting my flow. I hope you do not find this difficult to follow. I will make sure to differentiate if something comes up. 
So, in shop class, nothing started to do a very funny impersonation of our teacher, Mr. Callahan. He even painted in the mutton chop sideburns with a grease pencil. Hilarious. When Mr. Callahan found nothing doing this near the belt sander, he actually laughed because nothing wasn't doing the impersonation mean or anything. It was just that funny. I wish you could have been there because it was the hardest I've laughed since my brother left. My brother used to tell Polish jokes, which I know is wrong, but I just blocked out the Polish part and listened to the jokes. Hilarious. Oh, incidentally, my sister asked for her Autumn Leaves mixtape back. She listens to it all the time now. Love always, Charlie. September 29th, 1991 Dear friend, there is a lot to tell you about the last two weeks. A lot of it is good, but a lot of it is bad. Again, I don't know why this always happens. First of all, Bill gave me a C on my To Kill a Mockingbird essay because he said I run my sentences together. I am trying now to practice not to do that. He also said that I should use the vocabulary words that I learn in class like corpulent and jaundice. I would use them here, but I really don't think they are appropriate in this format. To tell you the truth, I don't know where they are appropriate to use. I'm not saying that you shouldn't know them. You should absolutely. But I just have never heard anyone use the words corpulent and jaundice ever in my life. That includes teachers. So what's the point of using words nobody else knows or can say comfortably? I just don't understand that. I feel the same way about some movie stars who are terrible to watch. Some of these people must have a million dollars at least, and yet they keep doing these movies. They blow up the bad guys, they yell at their detectives, they do interviews for magazines. Every time I see this one particular movie star in a magazine, I can't help but feel terribly sorry for her because nobody respects her at all, and yet they keep interviewing her. And the interviews all say the same thing. They start with what food they are eating in some restaurant. As Blank gingerly munched her Chinese chicken salad, she spoke of love. And all the covers say the same thing. Blank gets to the bottom of stardom, love, and his, her, hit new movie, television, show, album. I think it's nice for stars to do interviews to make us think they're just like us, but to tell you the truth, I get the feeling that it's all a big lie. The problem is, I don't know who's lying. And I don't know why these magazines sell as much as they do. And I don't know why the ladies in the dentist's office like them as much as they do. A Saturday ago, I was in the dentist's office, and I heard this conversation. Did you see that movie? As she points to the cover. I did. I saw it with Harold. What did you think? She is just lovely. Yeah, she is. Oh, I have this new recipe. Low fat? Uh-huh. Do you have some time tomorrow? No. Why don't you have Mike fax it to Harold? Okay. Then... These ladies started talking about the one star I mentioned before, and they both had very strong opinions. I think it's disgraceful. Did you read the interview in Good Housekeeping a few months back? Uh-huh. Disgraceful. Did you read the one in Cosmopolitan? No. God, it was practically the same interview. I don't know why they give her the time of day. The fact that one of these ladies was my mom made me feel particularly sad because my mom is beautiful. And she's always on a diet. Sometimes my dad calls her beautiful, but she cannot hear him. Incidentally, my dad is a very good husband. He's just pragmatic. After the dentist's office, my mom drove me to the cemetery where a lot of her relatives are buried. My dad does not like to go to the cemetery because it gives him the creeps. But I don't mind going at all because my Aunt Helen is buried there. My mom was always the pretty one, as they say, and my Aunt Helen was always the other one. The nice thing was my Aunt Helen was never on a diet. And my Aunt Helen was corpulent. Hey, I did it! My Aunt Helen would always let us kids stay up and watch Saturday Night Live when she was babysitting or when she was living with us and my parents went to another couple's house to get drunk and play board games. When I was very little, I remember going to sleep while my brother and sister and Aunt Helen watched Love Boat and Fantasy Island. I could never stay awake when I was that little. And I wish I could, because my brother and sister talk about those moments sometimes. Maybe it's sad that these are now memories. And maybe it's not sad. And maybe it's just the fact that we loved Aunt Helen, especially me, 
and this was the time we could spend with her. I won't start listing television episode memories, except one because I guess we're on the subject, and it seems like something everyone can relate to in a small way. And since I don't know you, I figure that maybe I can write about something that you can relate to. The family was sitting around watching the final episode of Mash, and I'll never forget it, even though I was very young. My mom was crying, my sister was crying, my brother was using every ounce of strength he had not to cry, and my dad left during one of the final moments to make a sandwich. Now, I don't remember much about the program itself because I was too young. But my dad never left to make a sandwich except during commercial breaks, and then he usually just sent my mom. I walked to the kitchen, and I saw my dad making a sandwich, and crying. He was crying harder than even my mom, and I couldn't believe it. When he finished making his sandwich, he put away the things in the refrigerator and stopped crying and wiped his eyes and saw me. Then he walked up, patted my shoulder, and said. This is our little secret, okay, champ? Okay, I said. And Dad picked me up with the arm that wasn't holding the sandwich and carried me to the room that had the television and put me on his lap for the rest of the television episode. At the end of the episode, he picked me up, turned off the TV, and turned around. And my dad declared that was a great series. And my mom said the best. And my sister asked, "How long was it on the air?" My brother replied, "Nine years, stupid." And my sister responded, "You stupid." And my dad said, "Stop it right now." And my mom said, "Listen to your father." And my brother said nothing. And my sister said nothing. And years later, I found out my brother was wrong. I went to the library to look up the figures, and I found out that the episode we watched is the highest watched anything of television history, which I find amazing because it felt like just the five of us. You know, a lot of us kids at school hate their parents. Some of them got hit, and some of them got caught in the middle of wrong lives. Some of them were trophies for their parents to show the neighbors, like ribbons or gold stars. And some of them just wanted to drink in peace. For me personally, as much as I don't understand my mom and dad, and as much as I feel sorry for both of them sometimes, I can't help but love them very much. My mom drives to visit the cemetery of people she loves. My dad cried during Mash and trusted me to keep his secret and let me sit on his lap and called me Champ. Incidentally, I only have one cavity, and as much as my dentist asked me to, I just can't bring myself to floss. Love always, Charlie. October sixth, nineteen ninety-one. Dear friend, I feel very ashamed. I went to the high school football game the other day, and I don't know exactly why. In middle school, Michael and I would go to the games sometimes, even though neither of us were popular enough to go. It was just a place to go on Fridays when we didn't want to watch television. Sometimes we would see Susan there, and she and Michael would hold hands. But this time, I went alone because Michael is gone, and Susan hangs around different boys now, and Bridget is still crazy. And Carl's mom sent him to a Catholic school, and Dave with the awkward glasses moved away. I was just kind of watching people, seeing who was in love and who was just hanging out, and I saw that kid I told you about. Remember nothing? Nothing was there at the football game, and he was one of the few people who was not an adult that was actually watching the game. I mean, really watching the game. He would yell things out, "Come on, Brad!" That's the name of our quarterback. Now, normally, I am very shy, but nothing seemed like the kind of guy you could just walk up to at a football game, even though you were three years younger and not popular. Hey, you're in my shop class. He was a very friendly person. I'm Charlie. I said, not too shy. And I'm Patrick. This is Sam. He pointed to a very pretty girl next to him, and she waved to me. Hey, Charlie. Sam had a very nice smile. They both told me to have a seat, and they both seemed to mean it. So I took a seat. I listened to nothing yell at the field, and I listened to his play-by-play -play analysis, and I figured out that this was a kid who knew football very well. He actually knew football as well as my brother. Maybe I should call nothing Patrick from now on, since that is how he introduced himself, 
and that is what Sam calls him. Incidentally, Sam has brown hair and very, very pretty green eyes. The kind of green that doesn't make a big deal about itself. I would have told you that sooner, but under the stadium lights, everything looked kind of washed out. It wasn't until we went to the big boy and Sam and Patrick started to chain smoke that I got a good look at her. The nice thing about the big boy was the fact that Patrick and Sam didn't just throw around inside jokes and make me struggle to keep up. Not at all. They asked me questions. How old are you, Charlie? Fifteen. What do you want to do when you grow up? I don't know just yet. What's your favorite band? I think maybe the Smiths because I love their song "Asleep," but I'm really not sure one way or the other because I don't know any other songs by them too well. What's your favorite movie? I don't really know. They're all the same to me. How about your favorite book? This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Why? Because it was the last one I read. This made them laugh because they knew I meant it, honest, not show off. Then they told me their favorites, and we sat quiet. I ate the pumpkin pie because the ladies said it was in season, and Patrick and Sam smoked more cigarettes. I looked at them, and they looked real happy together. A good kind of happy. And even though I thought Sam was very pretty and nice, and she was the first girl I ever wanted to ask on a date some day when I can drive, I did not mind that she had a boyfriend, especially if he was a good guy like Patrick. How long have you been going out? I asked. Then they started laughing, really laughing hard. What's so funny? I said. We're brother and sister, Patrick said, still laughing. But you don't look alike, I said. That's when Sam explained that they were actually stepsister and stepbrother, since Patrick's dad married Sam's mom. I was very happy to know that because I would really like to ask Sam on a date some day. I really would. She is so nice. I feel ashamed though because that night I had a weird dream. I was with Sam, and we were both naked. And her legs were spread over the sides of the couch. And I woke up. And. I had never felt that good in my life, but I also felt bad because I saw her naked without her permission. I think that I should tell Sam about this, and I really hope it does not prevent us from maybe making up inside jokes of our own. It would be very nice to have a friend again. I would like that even more than a date. Love always, Charlie. October fourteenth, nineteen ninety-one. Dear friend. Do you know what masturbation is? I think you probably do because you are older than me. But just in case, I will tell you: masturbation is when you rub your genitals until you have an orgasm. Wow! I thought that in those movies and television shows, when they talk about having a coffee break, that they should have a masturbation break. But then again, I think this would decrease productivity. I'm only being cute here. I don't really mean it. I just wanted to make you smile. I meant the wow, though. I told Sam that I dreamt that she and I were naked on the sofa, and I started crying because I felt bad. And do you know what she did? She laughed, not a mean laugh either, a really nice, warm laugh. She said that she thought I was being cute, and she said it was okay that I had a dream about her, and I stopped crying. Sam then asked me if I thought she was pretty, and I told her I thought she was lovely. Sam then looked me right in the eye. You know you're too young for me, Charlie. You do know that. Yes, I do. I don't want you to waste your time thinking about me that way. I won't. It was just a dream. Sam then gave me a hug, and it was strange because my family doesn't hug a lot, except my aunt Helen. But after a few moments, I could smell Sam's perfume, and I could feel her body against me, and I stepped back. Sam, I'm thinking about you that way. She just looked at me and shook her head. Then she put her arm around my shoulder and walked me down the hallway. We met Patrick outside because they didn't like to go to class sometimes; they preferred to smoke. Charlie has a Charlie-esque crush on me, Patrick. He does, huh? I'm trying not to. I offered, which just made them laugh. Patrick then asked Sam to leave. Which he did, and he explained some things to me, so I would know how to be around other girls and not waste my time thinking about Sam that way. 
Charlie, has anyone told you how it works? I don't think so. Well, there are rules you follow here not because you want to, but because you have to. You get it? I guess so. Okay. You take girls, for example. They're copying their mom's magazines and everything to know how to act around guys. I thought about the moms and magazines and the everythings, and the thought made me nervous, especially if it includes TV. I mean, it's not like in the movies where girls like assholes or anything like that. It's not that easy. They just like somebody that can give them a purpose. A uh, purpose? Right, you know, girls like guys to be a challenge. It gives them some mold to fit in how they act. Like a mom. What would a mom do if she couldn't fuss over you and make you clean your room? And what would you do without her fussing and making you do it? Everyone needs a mom, and a mom knows this, and it gives her a sense of purpose, you get it? Yeah, I said, even though I didn't. But I got it enough to say yeah and not be lying, though. The thing is, some girls think they can actually change guys. And what's funny is that if they actually did change them, they'd get bored. They'd have no challenge left. You just have to give girls some time to think of a new way of doing things, that's all. Some of them will figure it out here, some later, some never. I wouldn't worry about it too much. But I guess I did worry about it. I've been worrying about it ever since he told me. I look at people holding hands in the hallways, and I try to think about how it all works. At the school dances, I sit in the background and I tap my toe, and I wonder how many couples will dance to their song. In the hallways, I see the girls wearing the guys' jackets, and I think about the idea of property. And I wonder if anyone is really happy. I hope they are. I really hope they are. Bill looked at me, looking at people, and after class, he asked me what I was thinking about, and I told him. He listened, and he nodded, and made affirmation sounds. When I had finished, his face changed into a serious talk face. Do you always think this much, Charlie? Is it bad? I just wanted someone to tell the truth. Uh, not necessarily. It's just that sometimes people use thought to not participate in life. Is that bad? Yes. I think I participate, though. Don't you think I am? Well, are you dancing at these dances? I'm not a very good dancer. Are you going on dates? Well, I don't have a car, and even if I did, I can't drive because I'm 15. And anyway, I haven't met a girl I like except for Sam. But I'm too young for her, and she would always have to drive, which I don't think is fair. Bill smiled and continued asking me questions. Slowly, he got to problems at home, and I told him about the boy who makes mixtapes hitting my sister, because my sister only told me not to tell mom or dad about it, so I figured I could tell Bill. And he got this very serious look on his face after I told him, and he said something to me I don't think I will forget this semester or ever. Charlie, we accept the love we think we deserve. I just stood there quiet. Bill patted my shoulder and gave me a new book to read. He told me everything was going to be okay. I usually walk home from school because it makes me feel like I've earned it. What I mean is that I want to be able to tell my kids that I walked to school like my grandparents did in the old days. It's odd that I'm planning this considering I've never had a date, but I guess that makes sense. It usually takes me an extra hour or so to walk as opposed to taking the bus, but it's worth it when the weather is nice and cool like it was today. When I finally got home, my sister was sitting on a chair. My mom and dad were standing in front of her, and I knew that Bill had called home and told them. And I felt terrible. It was all my fault. My sister was crying. My mom was very, very quiet. My dad did all the talking. He said that my sister was not allowed to see the boy who hit her anymore, and he was going to have to talk with the boy's parents tonight. My sister then said that it was all her fault, and that she was provoking him, but my dad said it was no excuse. But I love him! I had never seen my sister cry that much. No, you don't. I hate you! No, you don't. My dad can be very calm sometimes. He's my whole world! Don't ever say that about anyone again, not even me. That was my mom. 
My mom chooses her battles carefully, and I can tell you one thing about my family. When my mom does say something, she always gets her way. And this time was no exception. My sister stopped crying immediately. After that, my dad gave my sister a rare kiss on the forehead. Then he left the house, got in his Oldsmobile, and drove away. I thought he probably was going to talk to the boy's parents, and I felt very sorry for them. His parents, I mean. Because my dad doesn't lose fights. He just doesn't. My mom went into the kitchen to make my sister's favorite thing to eat, and my sister looked at me. I hate you. My sister said it different than she said it to my dad. She meant it with me. She really did. I love you, was all I could say in return. You're a freak, you know that? You've always been a freak. Everyone says so. They always have. I'm trying not to be. Then I turned around and walked to my room and closed my door and put my head under my pillow and let the quiet put the things where they are supposed to be. By the way, I figure you are probably curious about my dad. Did he hit us when we were kids or now even? I just thought you might be curious because Bill was, after I told him about that boy and my sister. Well, if you are wondering, he didn't. He never touched my brother or sister. And the only time he ever slapped me was when I made my Aunt Helen cry. And once we all calmed down, he got on his knees in front of me and said that his stepdad hit him a lot. And he decided in college when my mom got pregnant with my older brother that he would never hit his kids. And he felt terrible for doing it. And he was so sorry. And he would never hit me again. And he hasn't. He's just stern sometimes. Love always, Charlie. October 15th, 1991 Dear friend, I guess I forgot to mention in my last letter that it was Patrick who told me about masturbation. I guess I also forgot to tell you how often I do it now, which is a lot. I don't like to look at pictures. I just close my eyes and dream about a lady I do not know. And I try not to feel ashamed. I never think about Sam when I do it. Never. That's very important to me because I was so happy when she said Charlie-esque since it felt like an inside joke of sorts. One night, I felt so guilty that I promised God that I would never do it again. So, I started using blankets, but then the blankets hurt, so I started using pillows, but then the pillows hurt, so I went back to normal. I wasn't raised very religiously because my parents went to Catholic school, but I do believe in God very much. I just never gave God a name, if you know what I mean. I hope I haven't let him down regardless. Incidentally, my dad did have a serious talk with the boy's parents. The boy's mother was very, very angry and screamed at her son. The boy's father kept quiet. And my dad didn't get too personal with them. He didn't tell them they did a lousy job raising their son or anything. As far as he was concerned, the only important thing was getting their help to keep their son away from his daughter. Once that was settled, he left them to deal with their family and came home to deal with his. At least that's how he put it. The one thing I did ask my dad was about the boy's problems at home. Whether or not he thought the parents hit their son. He told me to mind my own business. Because he didn't know and would never ask and didn't think it mattered. Not everyone has a sob story, Charlie. And even if they do, it's no excuse. That's all he said. And then we went to watch television. My sister is still mad at me, but my dad said I did the right thing. I hope that I did, but it's hard to tell sometimes. Love always, Charlie. October 28th, 1991 Dear friend, I'm sorry I haven't written to you in a couple of weeks, but I've been trying to participate, like Bill said. It's strange because sometimes I read a book... And I think I am the people in the book. Also, when I write letters, I spend the next two days thinking about what I figured out in my letters. I do not know if this is good or bad. Nevertheless, I am trying to participate. Incidentally, the book Bill gave me was Peter Pan by J.M. Barry. I know what you're thinking. The cartoon Peter Pan with the Lost Boys. The actual book is so much better than that. 
It's just about this boy who refuses to grow up, and when Wendy grows up, he feels very betrayed. At least that's what I got out of it. I think Bill gave me the book to teach me a lesson of some kind. The good news is that I read the book, and because of its fantasy nature, I could not pretend that I was in the book. That way, I could participate and still read. In terms of my participation in things, I am trying to go to social events that they set up at my school. It's too late to join any clubs or anything like that, but I still try to go to the things that I can. Things like the homecoming football game and dance, even if I don't have a date. I cannot imagine that I will ever come home for a homecoming game after I leave here, but it was so fun to pretend I was. I found Patrick and Sam sitting in their normal spot in the bleachers, and I started acting like I hadn't seen them in a year, even though I had seen them that afternoon and lunch when I ate my orange and they smoked cigarettes. Patrick, is that you? And Sam, it's been so long. Who's winning? God, college is such a trial. My professor is making me read twenty-seven books this weekend, and my girlfriend really needs me to paint signs for her protest rally Tuesday. Let those administrators know we mean business. Dad is busy with his golf swing, and Mom has her hands full with tennis. We must do this again. I would stay, but I have to pick up my sister from her emotional workshop. She's making real progress. Good to see ya. And then I walked away. I went down to the concession stand and bought three boxes of nachos and a diet coke for Sam. When I returned, I sat down and gave Patrick and Sam the nachos and Sam her diet coke, and Sam smiled. The great thing about Sam is that she doesn't think I'm crazy for pretending to do things. Patrick doesn't either, but he was too busy watching the game and screaming at Brad, the quarterback. Sam told me during the game that they were going over to their friend's house later for a party. Then she asked me if I wanted to go, and I said yes because I had never been to a party before. I had seen one at my house, though. My parents went to Ohio to see a very distant cousin get buried or married. I don't remember which. And they left my brother in charge of the house. He was sixteen at the time. My brother used the opportunity to throw a big party with beer and everything. I was ordered to stay in my room, which is okay because that's where everyone kept their coats, and it was fun looking through the stuff in their pockets. Every ten minutes or so, a drunk girl or boy would stumble in my room to see if they could make out there or something. Then they would see me and walk away. That is, except for this one couple. This one couple, whom I was told later were very popular and in love, stumbled into my room and asked if I minded them using it. I told them that my brother and sister said I had to stay here, and they asked if they could use the room anyway with me still in it. I said I didn't see why not, so they closed the door and started kissing, kissing very hard. After a few minutes, the boy's hand went up the girl's shirt, and she started protesting. Come on, Dave. What? The kid's in here. It's okay. And the boy kept working up the girl's shirt, and as much as she said no, he kept working it. After a few minutes, she stopped protesting, and pulled her shirt off, and she had a white bra on with lace. I honestly didn't know what to do by this point. Pretty soon, he took off her bra and started to kiss her breasts. And then he put his hand down her pants, and she started moaning. I think they were both very drunk. He reached to take off her pants, but she started crying really hard, so he reached for his own. He pulled his pants and underwear down to his knees. Please, Dave, no. But the boy just talked soft to her about how good she looked and things like that, and she grabbed his penis with her hands and started moving it. I wish I could describe this a little more nicely without using words like penis, but that's the way it was. After a few minutes, the boy pushed the girl's head down, and she started to kiss his penis. She was still crying. Finally, she stopped crying because he put his penis in her mouth, and I don't think you can cry in that position. I had to stop watching at that point because I started to feel sick. But it kept going on, and they kept doing other things, and she kept saying no. Even when I covered my ears, I could still hear her say that. My sister came in eventually to bring me a bowl of potato chips, and when she found the boy and the girl, they stopped. My sister was very embarrassed, but not as embarrassed as the girl. The boy looked kind of smug. He didn't say much. After they left, 
My sister turned to me. Did you know they were in here? Yes. They asked if they could use the room. Why didn't you stop them? I didn't know what they were doing. You pervert, was the last thing my sister said before she left the room, still carrying the bowl of potato chips. I told Sam and Patrick about this, and they both got very quiet. Sam said that she used to go out with Dave for a while before she got into punk music, and Patrick said he heard about the party. I wasn't surprised that he did because it kind of became a legend. At least that's what I've heard when I tell some kids who my older brother is. When the police came, they found my brother asleep on the roof. Nobody knows how he got there. My sister was making out in the laundry room with some senior. She was a freshman at the time. A lot of parents came to the house then to pick up their kids, and a lot of the girls were crying and throwing up. Most of the boys had run away by this point. My brother got in big trouble, and my sister was given a serious talk by my parents about bad influences. And that was that. The boy named Dave is a senior now. He plays on the football team. He is a wide receiver. I watched the end of the game when Dave caught a touchdown thrown from Brad. It ended up winning the game for our school. And people went crazy in the stands because we won the game. But all I could think about was that party. I thought about it quiet for a long time. Then I looked over to Sam. He raped her, didn't he? She just nodded. I couldn't tell if she was sad or just knew more things than me. We should tell someone, shouldn't we? Sam just shook her head this time. Then she explained about all the things you have to go through to prove it, especially in high school when the boy and girl are popular and still in love. The next day at the homecoming dance, I saw them dancing together, Dave and his girl, and I got really mad. It kind of scared me how mad I got. I thought about walking up to Dave and really hurting him like maybe I should have really hurt Sean. And I think I would have, but Sam saw me and put her arm around my shoulder like she does. She calmed me down, and I guess I'm glad she did because I think I would have gotten even madder if I started hitting Dave and his girl stopped me because she loved him. I think I would have gotten even madder about that. So I decided to do the next best thing and let the air out of Dave's tires. Sam knew which was his car. There is a feeling that I had Friday night after the homecoming game that I don't know if I will ever be able to describe except to say that it was warm. Sam and Patrick drove me to the party that night, and I sat in the middle of Sam's pickup truck. Sam loves her pickup truck because I think it reminds her of her dad. The feeling I had happened when Sam told Patrick to find a station on the radio, and he kept getting commercials and commercials, and a really bad song about love that had the word baby in it, and then more commercials. And finally, he found this really amazing song about this boy, and we all got quiet. Sam tapped her hand on the steering wheel. Patrick held his hand outside the car and made airwaves. And I just sat between them. After the song finished, I said something. I feel infinite. And Sam and Patrick looked at me like I said the greatest thing they ever heard. Because the song was that great, and because we all really paid attention to it. Five minutes of a lifetime were truly spent, and we felt young in a good way. I've since bought the record, and I would tell you what it was, but truthfully, it's not the same unless you're driving to your first real party and you're sitting in the middle of the seat of a pickup with two nice people when it starts to rain. We got to the house where the party was, and Patrick did the secret knock. It would be hard to describe to you this knock without sound. The door opened a crack, and this guy with frizzy hair looked out at us. Patrick, known as Patty, known as nothing? Bob? The door opened, and the old friends hugged each other. Then Sam and Bob hugged each other. Then Sam spoke. This is our friend Charlie. And you won't believe it. Bob hugged me. Sam told me as we were hanging up our coats that Bob was baked like a fucking cake. I really had to quote that one even though it has a swear. The party was in the basement of this house. The room was quite smoky and the kids were much older. 
There were two girls showing each other their tattoos and belly button rings. Seniors, I think. This guy named Fritz something was eating a lot of Twinkies. Fritz's girlfriend was talking to him about women's rights, and he just kept saying, I know, baby. Sam and Patrick started smoking cigarettes. Bob went up to the kitchen when he heard the bell ring. When he came back, he brought a can of Milwaukee's best beer for everyone, as well as two new party guests. There was Maggie, who needed to use the bathroom. And there was Brad, the quarterback of the high school football team. No kidding! I do not know why this excited me, but I guess when you see somebody in the hallway or on the field or something, it's nice to know that they are a real person. Everyone was very friendly to me and asked me lots of questions about myself. I guess because I was the youngest, and they didn't want me to feel out of place, especially after I said no to having beer. I once had a beer with my brother when I was 12, and I just didn't like it. It's really that simple for me. Some of the questions I was asked was what grade I was in and what did I want to be when I grow up. I am a freshman, and I don't know just yet. I looked around, and I saw that Sam and Patrick had left with Brad. That's when Bob started passing around food. Would you like a brownie? Yes, thank you. I was actually quite hungry because normally Sam and Patrick take me to the big boy after the football games, and I guess I was used to it by now. I ate the brownie, and it tasted a little weird, but it was still a brownie, so I still liked it. But this was not an ordinary brownie. Since you are older, I think you know what kind of brownie it was. After 30 minutes, the room started to slip away from me. I was talking to one of the girls with the belly button ring, and she seemed like she was in a movie. I started blinking a lot and looking around, and the music sounded heavy, like water. Sam came down, and when she saw me, she turned to Bob. What the hell is your problem? Come on, Sam, he likes it. Ask him. How do you feel, Charlie? Light. You see? Bob actually looked a little nervous, which I was later told was paranoia. Sam sat down next to me and held my hand, which felt cool. Are you seeing anything, Charlie? Light. Does it feel good? Uh-huh. Are you thirsty? Uh-huh. What would you like to drink? A milkshake. And everyone in the room, except Sam, erupted in laughter. He's stoned! Are you hungry, Charlie? Uh-huh. What would you like to eat? A milkshake. I don't think they would have laughed any harder, even if what I said was at all funny. Then, Sam took my hand and stood me up on the dizzy floor. Come on, we'll get you a milkshake. As we were leaving, Sam turned to Bob. I still think you're an asshole. All Bob did was laugh. And Sam finally laughed too. And I was glad that everyone seemed as happy as they seemed. Sam and I got up to the kitchen, and she turned on the light. Wow, it was so bright. I couldn't believe it. It was like when you see a movie in the theater during the day... And when you leave the movie, you can't believe that it's still daylight outside. Sam got some ice cream and some milk in a blender. I asked her where the bathroom was, and she pointed around the corner almost like it was her house. I think she and Patrick spent a lot of time here when Bob was still in high school. When I got out of the bathroom, I heard a noise in the room where we left our coats. I opened the door, and I saw Patrick kissing Brad. It was a stolen type of kissing. They heard me in the door and turned around. Patrick spoke first. Is that you, Charlie? Sam's making me a milkshake. Who is this kid? Brad just looked real nervous and not in the Bob way. He's a friend of mine. Relax. Patrick then took me out of the room and closed the door. He put his hands on both of my shoulders and looked me straight in the eye. Brad doesn't want people to know. Why? Because he's scared. Why? Because he is... Wait. Are you stoned? They said I was downstairs. Sam is making me a milkshake. Patrick tried to keep from laughing. Listen, Charlie. Brad doesn't want people to know. I need you to promise that you won't tell anyone. This will be our little secret, okay? Okay. Thanks. With that... Patrick turned around and went back into the room. I heard some muffled voices, and Brad seemed upset, 
but I didn't think it was any of my business, so I went back to the kitchen. I have to say that it was the best milkshake I ever had in my life. It was so delicious it almost scared me. Before we left the party, Sam played me a few of her favorite songs. One was called Blackbird. The other was called MLK. They were both very beautiful. I mentioned the titles because they were as great when I listened to them sober. Another interesting thing happened at the party before we left. Patrick came downstairs. I guess Brad had left. And Patrick smiled. And Bob started making fun of him having a crush on the quarterback. And Patrick smiled more. I don't think I ever saw Patrick smile so much. Then Patrick pointed at me and said something to Bob. He's something, isn't he? Bob nodded his head. Patrick then said something I don't think I'll ever forget. He's a wallflower. And Bob really nodded his head. And the whole room nodded their head. And I started to feel nervous in the Bob way, but Patrick didn't let me get too nervous. He sat down next to me. You see things. You keep quiet about them. And you understand. I didn't know that other people thought things about me. I didn't know that they looked. I was sitting on the floor of a basement of my first real party between Sam and Patrick, and I remembered that Sam introduced me as her friend to Bob. And I remembered that Patrick had done the same for Brad. And I started to cry. And nobody in that room looked at me weird for doing it. And then I really started to cry. Bob raised his drink and asked everyone to do the same. To Charlie! And the whole group said, To Charlie! I didn't know why they did that, but it was very special to me that they did. Especially Sam, especially her. I would tell you more about the homecoming dance, but now that I'm thinking about it, me letting out the air of Dave's tires was the best part. But I usually like songs you can't dance to, so I didn't do it too much. Sam did look very pretty in her dress, but I was trying not to notice because I'm trying not to think of her that way. I did notice that Brad and Patrick never talked once during the whole dance because Brad was off dancing with a cheerleader named Nancy, who was his girlfriend. And I did notice that my sister was dancing with the boy she wasn't supposed to, even though a different boy picked her up at the house. After the dance, we left in Sam's pickup. Patrick was driving this time. As we were approaching the Fort Pitt tunnel, Sam asked Patrick to pull up to the side of the road. I didn't know what was going on. Sam then climbed in the back of the pickup, wearing nothing but her dance dress. She told Patrick to drive, and he got this smile on his face. I guess they have done this before. Anyway, Patrick started driving really fast, and just before we got to the tunnel, Sam stood up and the wind turned her dress into ocean waves. When we hit the tunnel, all the sound got scooped up into a vacuum and it was replaced by a song on the tape player, a beautiful song called Landslide. When we got out of the tunnel, Sam screamed this really fun scream and there it was, downtown. Lights on buildings and everything that makes you wonder. Sam sat down and started laughing. Patrick started laughing. I started laughing. And in that moment, I swear we were infinite. Love always, Charlie.